May God add his blessing to the reading from Psalm 32 here this morning. For his birthday, Johnny got a slingshot. Remember guys when we got the slingshot? Maybe some of you girls did too. And, and every day after school he would come home and he would practice with that slingshot. Oh, he got pretty good. He got where he could take his shot and boom, he'd hit the target. He was good. And he practiced because he knew in the summer he would be going to grandma's house. Grandma lived out where he would have lots of targets. He's going to spend the summer there. He and his sister. And so sure enough, summer came and everything was packed and slingshot was in hand and they were headed to grandma. Next morning, after the first night there, next morning, gets up and he's scouting around and, and a duck goes by. And instinctively, he just takes his slingshot, pow, the duck is dead. He goes over to the duck and finds out, that's grandma's pet duck. So, of course, uh, you know, now he's guilty, so he wants to hide it. So he takes the duck and he hides the duck in the wood pile. Only to glance over his shoulder and who's standing there? Oh yeah, Sister Sarah. Yeah, she sees the whole thing. So lunch uh, comes and uh, Grandma says, Sarah, please, if you would help clear the dishes and wash the dishes, that'd be great. And Sarah says, you know, Johnny's been talking to me. He would really like to wash the dishes today. <laughs> and she looks at Johnny and says, remember the duck. <laughs> Have you ever felt guilty? Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt guilty before? Yeah. Have you ever been sitting somewhere, standing somewhere in your car, remembering what you did, remembering what you thought, remembering what you said that hurt somebody, and you feel guilty about it? It's not good, is it? It's not a good feeling, but we handle it a lot of ways. We, we do think of things that we maybe we shouldn't have done that, or here's how we should have handled that better, but our guilt... Our guilt just continues to overwhelm us. So you felt like that. So have I. I have those uh, feelings of guilt too. And I think somewhere along the line, I know for me, maybe for you, we've all killed a duck. Can you remember that duck you killed? I can remember some of mine. But we ask for forgiveness, don't we? We know that the Bible says... That Satan loves to use against us those things. Revelation 12.10 tells us, Satan, the accuser of the brethren. Satan accuses us, makes us feel guilty, makes us feel horrible about ourselves. But we also know that Paul tells us that he knows, that God knows that we have sinned and we fall short of the glory of heaven. So we have opportunities. Billy Graham said he traveled the world. And universally, what he found is that people everywhere, no matter what country he was in, they all felt a sense of guilt. And unresolved guilt does horrible damage. Doctors tell us that people that have unresolved guilt get sick more. Because if you kill, keep that guilt inside you, it starts to eat away at you. David even said, what, in verse 3, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. That's what guilt does to you. Carl Menninger um, was a famous psychiatrist in the 20th century. He was not a Christian, but he wrote a book, Whatever Became of Sin. And he decided that based on all of the people he had worked with, he felt like near the end of his time, he felt like if he could get people to confess their sins, rid themselves of guilt, he felt like 75% of his patients could have walked out of the hospital. 75%. Back in 2006, the University of Toronto did a study, found that people with guilty consciences wash their hands more. So they did a test. And they had people confess their sins, the things they had done wrong, and wash their hands when you do it. And then they had another group that they didn't tell that to. The group that confessed their sins, washed their, or talked about their sins, washed their hands twice as much as those that never 
Never talked about it. David says, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Through my groaning all day, for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me, and my strength was sapped in the heat of the summer. David's guilt made him suffer physically. His bones wasting away. Heavy weight upon him. His strength was totally gone. But why would David feel like that? Why would we feel like that? Behavioral scientists call it cognitive dissonance. That's a, that's a good uh, science word, isn't it? Cognitive dissonance. Cognitive mind dissonance conflict. Let's just call it mind conflict. That's the way I tend to understand it more. When my mind is in conflict with my action, I can feel guilty. I think one way and act another. So there's mind conflict. And the natural response then of dissonance is to try to get rid of it one way or the other. And that means I either need to change the way I, the way I think to fit what I do or change what I do to the way I think. Now the Bible would tell us the most logical course to do this in is to repent. To ask God to forgive us. To tell Him those things we are doing wrong. But when we want to repent... Then we create more cognitive dissonance, more mind conflict. Because what do we have to do? We have to admit we're wrong. Do you like admitting you're wrong? I don't like admitting I'm wrong, do I, Rhonda? I don't like admitting I'm wrong. I don't think we do, naturally, like, like admitting we are wrong. But when we do admit it and ask for repentance, we know we feel better. This time of year, we get to blame politicians, don't we? We get to look at their lives and tear them apart every day. I mean, can you go a day now without hearing something negative about Hillary and Donald? Heck, we might even know some bad things about their family. We are even, their health now is being called into question. All kinds of things. Because politicians, when they get caught, what do they do? Deny, deny, deny. Yeah, and, and then what else do they do? They employ a little righteous indignation. How dare you imply? No one's ever questioned my integrity. Some of us in the voting public now are saying, well, maybe we ought to. We cover up. Maybe we delay. Don't put it out there. Or it's out there, but don't, rec don't acknowledge it. And if we don't acknowledge it, it'll just go away. People will stop talking about it. So we minimize the mistake. I did wrong, but really it wasn't my fault. Or we deflect it. You know, I, I did wrong, but he did worse. We like to, we like to say that's how the politicians act. But then we go home and we're alone and we're standing in front of the mirror and we go, I look like a politician today. I did wrong and I denied it. I said some things I shouldn't have and I'm hoping they go away. Maybe if I just don't acknowledge it, no one will bring it up to me. Well, you know, I'm not as bad as the other guy. Really, I said it, but it wasn't my fault. We don't have to turn on the TV, do we? That's who we are. But we like to look at other people. But then there's a group of people out there that believe that guilt is bad. There's a, there's a term called socialization. And that's where a people uh, that are guilty uh, are only guilty because their parents made them feel bad. Chuck, you did, you're a bad boy. Chuck, I can't believe you did that. And then, the only reason they did that is because their parents did it to them. And then their parents did it to them. Really, I'm going to blame my great-great-great-great-grandfather who was in the Civil War and he probably made everybody feel guilty. That's, a, that's another... You can see that on YouTube. There's, there's videos about socialization where guilt is bad and it only comes from our parents. We should never feel guilty. But then you can turn right to the next page and find a Christian author, a believer, a believer that says guilt is good. Because guilt is our check engine light. Guilt is that red light that comes on that says, 
You better check something in your car. It's not right. Some of you know that uh, while I owned the dry cleaner the last couple years, I was the manager of Jaguar Land Rover. And so I get to organize these off-roading events, which was great. 20 to 40 Land Rovers. We'd go up in the mountains, act like we know what we were doing. And we'd go through water and rocks. And, anyway. and typically, you know, you would bump something, bang something, and the check engine light would come on. Well, and, 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 my, and did in mind plenty of times. And, but anyway, I had a friend of mine that he used to take black electrical tape and put it over the check engine light on the dashboard. So he didn't see it. <laughs> well, I don't see it, you know, I don't have to worry about it. It's probably just a sensor, it's probably the gas cap, it's probably something got bumped, I'm not going to worry about it. So he put black tape over it. And I thought, you know, I've done that. I've done things wrong. And I just put black tape over it. I knew in my soul it was wrong. I knew I said the wrong thing. I knew I hurt somebody's feelings, but maybe. I just put black tape over it, and I don't see it. I won't feel it. It doesn't work, does it? That check engine light's still on, isn't it? And that's where we are with our guilt. Guilt is good because why? What if... What if... Well, you hear of this. You hear of people setting animals on fire. You hear of people abusing other people and not feeling bad about it. You know, if we don't have guilt over those kind of things, there's something wrong inside of us. We need that check engine light to say, that's not right. And we can go to God with those things and help clear ourselves, cleanse ourselves, so that we can be exactly what He wants us to be. Guilt is one of those things that people hear about in faith communities. I don't like to go there because they make me feel guilty. I don't like to go there because they judge me and I feel guilty and I don't want to go and be feeling guilty. Well, is there a better place to feel guilt than at the base of the cross? Fred, is there a better place than that? No. Th this person died for, for your guilt. When you want to cover it up with black electro tape, you want to rip it off. Give it to me. I died for that. That's why I came to earth. To rid you of your guilt. Don't hold on to it. Let it go. Give it to me. Apologize. Be cleansed. Live life. Be what I, I created you to be. Don't let Satan take it away from you. I'm here for you. I gave my life for you. Talk to me. I was with Brian Morris a few weeks ago. And I was sharing with he and Paul how much I enjoyed reading the Bible. I love it. You know I love it. I love reading this. And I said, the more I read this, the more I want to pray. The more I pray, the more I want to read this. And Brian hit it on the head with me. That I, and no one told me this before. And so, if you all know this, then I'll just agree that I'm a moron and I missed it somewhere along the way. But he said, Chuck, when you're reading the Bible, God's talking to you. And when you're praying, you're talking to Him. And that the way it is. We're to pray to Him because He wants to hear our pain and our hurt. He wants to hear from us because He loves us. And then when we do that, when we get that, when we get that communication going, then we want to read because He wants to talk to us. Let Him talk. Let Him talk. Well... It's, it's normal for us to feel this way, isn't it? Because we want to cover up things because it's in the first book of the Bible. Uh, Adam, did you eat from that tree? Well, you know that lady you gave to me? Uh, Adam, uh, why'd you cover yourself up? Well, you know, I didn't want you to see me. Are you hiding in the woods? Well, I didn't think you would see. We get it, honestly. It comes from Adam, right? He doesn't say that it wasn't his fault. He just wants to blame somebody else. But he can't blame anybody else because he chose to sin. We choose to sin. Don't cover it up. Don't blame somebody else. 
admit it. Give it to God. We're going to make mistakes. We're not perfect people. But give it to God. Well, there was a study that between 4,000 people in Israel and the United States talked about confessing. They found that if you only confess half of your wrong, you're as in much pain as if you didn't confess. The Harvard Review said what their study found was you have to confess 100% of your guilt. All of it. And that will relieve you when you tell the whole truth. Full confession works. It works because God promised that it would. So you remember Johnny? Johnny's been doing a lot of dishes. Got some red hands. Wasn't sleeping good. Sister kept whispering those words. Remember the duck. So he decided, I'm going to tell Grandma. So at breakfast, he was getting the dishes. He said, Grandma, I killed your duck. She said, you know, Johnny, I know. I saw it. I was watching through the kitchen window. I saw everything that happened. And I love you. And I was wondering when you were going to come tell me. Because I was wondering how long you were going to let Sarah enslave you. <laughs> but I forgave you the minute you did it. I knew you were sorry. I saw you hide it. But I forgive you because I love you. Many, many days. Jesus has looked out the kitchen window at Chuck. And some of the things he's done. And I've come to him at the cross in many places, in many states. And he said, I know. I know what you did. I saw it. I was there. But I forgive you. Because I love you. And I will always love you. And know this. You are never outside of my presence. You will always be with me. That knowledge impacts me and my life every day. Do I sin? Absolutely. Do I think bad things? Yes. Do I say some things that are hurtful? Absolutely. Do I regret them? Yes. Do I want to say them all? No. But I am thankful that I can go to a God who tries to lift me up, cleans me off, get back out there in the game, Chuck. I called you into the game. You're going to keep playing. You're going to get knocked down. But get up. Come on. I'm with you. Some days he pulls me. Some days he kicks me. But every day, I walk arm in arm with him in the game. Now here's why I say that. Because eight out of ten people that are outside of this church today aren't going to go to church in the state of Florida. So if you're wondering, who should I talk to? Eight out of ten. Don't go. Now, maybe they're waiting for you to hold their hand. Maybe you, they're waiting for you to put your arm on their shoulder. Maybe they're waiting for you just to listen. Just, just hear my pain. Nobody cares about me. Nobody will listen to my pain. But we as believers, we that have the Holy Spirit walking with us daily, we can listen, right? We can be there to hold their hand. We can be there to put our arm on their shoulder. Now, now, don't think that you have to invite them here. Just love them like Jesus loves you through the kitchen window. Love them that way. Hold them up. Clean them up a little bit. Show them how to meet this wonderful Savior that loves you more than anything can love you.
through the muck and mire and grease of your life and find a community of faith for them. Help them. It doesn't have to be here. Just a community of faith. Because, you know, there are people out there that are doing that and some of those people stumble their way in here. And then we need to nurture them and feed them and love them and welcome them and let them know that, you know, Jesus loves you and so do I. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Lord, we are so thankful that we can come to you as sinners, as imperfect people, knowing full well that you created us and you love us and that you are there for us no matter. And that you have seen all that we've done. You know all of our thoughts. And because of that, Lord, we have a relationship with you like no other. You know things about Chuck that nobody knows. Just me and you. We share that. And you know things about all these people that only you and they know. What a beautiful relationship that can be. So Lord, we thank you that we can come and worship you openly. So make us bold witnesses for you, Lord. That when we leave here, we can't help but tell somebody a little something about you. Amen. Our final hymn is number 593. Here I am, Lord. 593.